Hi everybody, welcome to today's video. We're going to have a look at the manner of articulation. To describe a sound, we talk about the place of articulation, the manner of articulation and phonation as well. And in today's video, we'll look at the manner of articulation. There are different manners of articulation for consonant sounds in English. Sometimes the manner of articulation is also called the quality of a consonant. Let's look at them. First of all, we have plosives. Sometimes they are also called stops. So you will see both of those terms being used. Now, how are they formed? Part of the vocal tract is closed off completely. So there will be full closure and no air can escape. But then the air is released suddenly with a sharp burst. And suddenly is really important because it leads to this little explosion of air. That's where we get the word plosive from. Here are all the plosives that we have in English. P as in pay and gap, B, B and table. And you can see here the closure is formed with both my lips. P, B. Then we have T in two and pet, d in day and mad, k in cat and make, g in go and bag, and another plosive sound that you might not have heard of before is the glottal stop, this funny looking symbol. Um, that we have usually in between vowels, for example, when we say Oh, the glottal opens and closes and opens again and forms a glottal stop. So it's not in the word ah oh or oh, it's in between. If this is new to you, you want to find out more about the glottal stop, I have a specific video on the glottal stop. So all of those are plosives in English. In total, we have seven plosive consonants in English. I added a little image for you to remember plosives, air explosion that you can hear. Hopefully it will help you remember the plosives. Now, of course, if you want to know where exactly the closure occurs, so the place of articulation, make sure to check out my other video on that. And also before we move on very quickly, remember phonation, some of these plosives are voiced and others are unvoiced. But again, there's a separate video on that. Let's move on. The next group, also a very big group, are the fricatives. Fricatives are formed very differently to plosives. Here, two articulators move close so that the air flues, flows through a small opening. So there isn't complete closure, it's just that there is a very narrow space, a very small opening. And now what happens is that this causes the air turbulence that we can hear. It's really the friction of the air passing through this little small opening that we can hear when we form fricatives. Here are all the fricatives we have in English, as in fun or half, v as in very or have, th in think and tooth, I know this is a funny symbol for the unvoiced th sound, the voiced th sound is the as in they or breathe, then we have s in see or less, z in zebra or is, and then we have sh in shoe and push and zh in pleasure and asia. And last but not least, we have in happy and 
behind. So we have nine fricatives in English. This is the biggest group actually of sounds. And in the sound sh, I think it's very noticeable. We have a little closure here, but it's not completely. It's just a small opening near the teeth. Sh, and the air passing through, we can hear the air turbulence. Of course, all of those have the same manner of articulation, but then our tongue and the position or movement of our tongue, of course, helps form the sound as well. That is why, yes, they're all fricatives, but obviously they do not all sound the same because the place where the small opening occurs is different and also the tongue position will be different. And just like with the plosives, some of these are unvoiced and some of these are voiced. So they differ in quite a lot of other characteristics. Again, I added a little image to help you remember fricatives. So this is just like a cloud <laughs> blowing out some wind. And I thought maybe this helps you remember fricatives has something to do with air turbulence and the little small opening. Let's have a look at the next group, number three. Those are affricates. Now, those are actually quite easy to remember, I think, because they are basically a combination of the first two groups. So it's a combination of a plosive followed straight away by a fricative. And that means that the affricate sounds start by fully stopping the air first from leaving the vocal tract, but then the, the air is released and not maybe as suddenly as with a plosive, a pure plosive, but it's released through a small constricted opening. Okay, so there's a difference here. It's not like a full open release. It's just a small opening. And again, we can hear the air friction. And so we have, for example, t and sh forming ch. And this is now a new sound and classified as one sound. Ch as in child and march. So we have t straight away followed by sh, ch. And then we have the voiced counterpart d and j together, j, j, for example, in juice or orange. Here we have it at the end. So there are only two affricate sounds in English. Now, we have a fourth group and those are the nasals. Now, nasals makes you think of nose and that's quite good because the nose or the nasal cavity plays a big role when we produce nasal sounds. So here, the sound is blocked through either the lips or the tongue somewhere in the vocal tract. It's blocked from leaving the mouth and instead the sound is released through the nasal cavity. Now the nasal cavity is the, the big space from our throat up through our nose. And uh, we have three nasals in total. We have m, mm, n, mm, and ng. Mm. And I've given you a couple of example words, but just before we have a look at them to demonstrate that the air is really released through the nose and not the mouth. So if I say mm and I pinch my nose, see what happens. Mm, the sound stops because it cannot really escape anymore. All right. And the same is true for n and n. So the sound is really released through your nose. So we have m in more or come. N, no or sun and then the ng in sing and think. So we have this sound always when the spelling is ng or nk. They are three nasals in English and I put an image of a nose to help you remember those. Next we have an interesting group. Number five is the group of the approximants. Now it's not a huge group, but the sounds that belong to this group still vary a little bit. So how are they formed? 
approximants are formed when two articulators come together to form a narrow space in the mouth and again the air flows through it. You might think, wait, isn't that the same for the fricatives? Why are they a different group? There is a difference because this little space is not as small as with fricative sounds. So it flows through this narrow space, but it's not close enough or not small enough to make the air friction audible. So there's a difference in size in this small opening that is formed. Now, you could say, therefore, approx approximants are in between fricatives and vowel sounds. And vowel sounds is really no closure at all. The mouth is pretty wide open, like A, ah, E, E, very wide. And fricatives, f, sh, there's a very small opening. So the approximants are kind of in between those two groups in terms of opening of the mouth. And here are the four approximants that we have in English. First of all, we have Y, as in yes or young. Then we have W, in when or in between. And then we have L, in light or milk. Yes, there is a dark and a light L, but they don't really cause any difference in meaning. So we just treat it as one phoneme, L. And then we have R in right and carry. Now, because this group is a bit special and there are subgroups within approximants, I've created this little table for you to help you. Y and W, both approximants, that's true, but they are also often called glides or semi-vowels. So you will see those terms being used. And they also share something in common. If you say y and w, just pay attention to your articulators. Y, there's little movement in your tongue when you form the sound, y. And the same with w, there's movement in the lips, also articulators. So because of this movement, both of those are called transitional sounds. And that just means the articulators move during the sound production. Y and W. Now let's have a look at the other two, L and R. Those are also called liquids. Now L is also called a lateral approximant. And in fact, very, very often you will see um, the other sounds, Y, W and R, also being called approximants with a specific um, adjective before it. And that usually refers to um, either the manner of articulation or the place. And that's just to distinguish them from one another. So L also called a lateral or a lateral approximant. And here, if you just form the sound, L, you can see the tip of the tongue is touching the alveolar ridge and the air flows on either side of the tongue out of the mouth. L. And so that is really what we call a lateral, but it's still an approximant because the opening is quite big and we hear a sound, but we don't hear the air friction. And R is sometimes also called a rotate. Now I've used the symbol here from the Adrian Underhill chart. The one that you can see in the IPA looks a little bit different. It looks like an upside down R. And again, two images to help you remember those four approximant sounds. You can remember them maybe in their subgroups. So we have this figure skater here too, because they're gliding over the ice. And so those are the glides or the semi-vowels, y and w. And then l and r, the liquids. You've got this little image of some liquid, some water. Okay, and now we come to one more group, number six, and that's the tap. Now, again, this is a very specific sound. We call it usually the flap T. You can see the IPA symbol here. It looks like a bit of a funny R. 
And this is produced when the tongue just very quickly taps against the alveolar ridge. So there's only one flap T, a tap sound. And so it's always exactly the same production. It's always against the alveolar ridge. In English, we don't have any other tap sounds. Um, so I've given you an example here. Again, you can see the IPA symbol, and then we have the word butter. Now, if you have more of a British English pronunciation like me, you probably just say butter and pronounce a full t sound, which is of course a plosive. However, Americans very often will say butter. So instead of a full t, they just do a little flap t tap. So it's just butter. Just say it a few times and pay attention to the movement of your tongue, especially the tip of your tongue, butter. So there's this very quick tap against the alveolar ridge. We also have it in between words. So for example, here, a lot of, if I say it fast, a lot of, a lot of. And in fact, here I would say the majority of English speakers will use a flap T sound like this little flap instead of a full t plosive, a lot of, because usually we talk fast, it's much quicker to say this tap instead of a full plosive. And I put a little picture of a tap dancer. <laughs> Hopefully this will help you remember the tap sound. So here's a summary again, we have different manners of articulations of all the sounds in English. We have plosives, also called stops. We have fricatives. Then those were two big groups. And then we had affricates and they were a combination of plosives with fricatives. And there were only two. Then we had three nasals, four approximants, and they were in really divided into subgroups of glides or semivowels and laterals, also called liquids. And last but not least, we had one tap sound, the flap T. And finally, I thought you might find this table really helpful. Here you have all the consonant sounds of English in a chart showing the place and manner of articulation. So on the left, you can see the manner that we've just went over, plosives, fricatives, affricates, nasals, laterals, and approximants. And then of course, you also might want to know, well, where in the mouth are they produced? That is the place of articulation. And it literally goes through the mouth from bilabial, that means really formed with both your lips, to labiodental, interdental, alveolar, postalveolar, palatal, and velar and glottal in all of the consonant sounds are given. And in fact, the only one that I left out is the flap T, apologies for that. Um, it would be um, a list, obviously a manner of articulation on its own. And it is an alveolar sound as well, like the full T. Now the word is given twice and that is because um, it's really produced if you say it, w, it's yes, produced at the front with both of the lips, but the tongue also rises um, near the velum, and so it is a bilabial velar sound. That's why it's listed twice. And you can see that they are color coded. So I've also given you the phonation. By that, I mean whether the sound is unvoiced or voiced. So voiced means we're using our vocal cords, they're vibrating in the sound production. This gives a lot more volume and resonance to the sound. So the voiced sounds are all red and the unvoiced sounds are in this green teal color. And they are a lot quieter as a result because the vocal cords stay open and are not involved in the sound production. Please leave me a comment or any questions you have underneath this video. I'd love to get back to you. You can find many more videos on English pronunciation and phonology on my channel, on the IPA, pitch, the vowel chart, linking sounds, connected speech, everything. You can find a lot there. I've organized it into playlists. But if you can't find anything or you have a suggestion for a future video, 
please write to me and leave a comment.